Hi everyone, it's Brendan O'Neill here with an exciting announcement. In October, we'll be doing a special live episode of the Brendan O'Neill Show. I'll be joined on stage by the legendary Rod Little. You won't want to miss this. It is part of an event called Podcast Live in London on the 5th of October, and you can join me and Rod between 2.30 and 3.30 p.m. Tickets are now available at podcastlive.com. There are two types of tickets. You can buy tickets for just the Brendan O'Neill Show, or you can buy an all-day ticket, which includes access to all the other podcasts at Podcast Live. Whichever ticket you choose, whether it's an all-day or a single show, when you go to podcastlive.com, make sure you click the link below the Brendan O'Neill Show logo, as that is the only way you can guarantee a seat for our podcast. So that's the Brendan O'Neill Show with me and Rod Little live at Podcast Live on the 5th of October. Don't miss it. They are denying a decent education to black kids, right? Because being able to understand Shakespeare is a right <laughs> that my kids deserve, right? And knowing who Mozart was and hearing his music is a right that they should be able to access, not being shown Stormzy, who they know anyway. And this is all about race. Stormzy's black, Mozart's white. In fact, Mozart is a dead white man. Yeah. And anybody who's a dead white man, they don't want to teach dead white men. Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Catherine Birbelsing. Catherine is a teacher, educationalist and writer and sometimes a quite divisive public figure especially on the issue of education and also on the issues of discipline, patriotism and race. She burst into the national consciousness in 2010 when she gave a speech at the Conservative Party conference in which she really took to task the British education system. She talked about the culture of excuses, the culture of low standards, the sea of bureaucracy and the chaos in British classrooms. She has written widely on education and on opportunity, and she founded the Michaela Community School in Brent in 2014. It has been described as the strictest school in the UK. I have had the pleasure of visiting Michaela, and to me it seems to have the ethos and standards of a private school, even though it is a state school slash free school. Catherine has been described by The Guardian as an education guru who violently polarises opinion along party political lines. Labour loathe her, conservatives adore her. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. The first thing I want to ask you, I know you're probably a bit tired of talking about this 2010 incident, and I think you even regret making the speech or you th I think you said at one point that it ruined your life but could for the yeah. benefit of um, listeners who either may have forgotten what happened or don't know what happened can you just give us a brief summary of what you said there and the enormous impact that it had yeah well I was just a bit naive um, I was a teacher who spent all my time marking books didn't really pay much attention to politics was invited along uh, because I'd been writing this blog uh, called to miss with love and then we were turning it into an anonymous book. Um, and the woman who was publishing it, she happened to know Michael Gove and told me to go along and talk to him and tell him all my ideas. Mm. I was a bit silly at the time. I, 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 before Michael Gove actually went to meet Steve Hilton, who was working with David Cameron at the time, turned up at number 10 with my, with my list of things that he needed to just <laughs> fix, you know. And I said, just do this and then everything will be okay in education. And then they said, come along and talk at the conference, which I presume was really their whole reason for talking to me in the first place. Mm. And I, I didn't kind of understand that at the time. Time, I went along and I said the things that I thought were broken about the system. Um, I did know that I was being a bit naughty. I had been warned that it would be on uh, BBC Parliament, um, but I figured who watches BBC Parliament? Mm. Now, the thing is, in those days, there was no Twitter. YouTube wasn't that big a thing. And so that sounds really dumb right now to think, well, yeah, but it doesn't matter if nobody watches it. The fact is, it's been videoed, therefore it could be replayed over and over again. Yeah. That hadn't occurred to me. 
And so I thought I'd be able to get up there, give my little speech, people would clap and I'd go home. But in fact, because I said things that I've said many times since, and we will talk about it today, you know, in, in, in the podcast, they gave me a standing ovation at which point the press turned towards me, you know, and I was just a teacher <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. And in the end, there was just so much noise around everything I'd said that um, I had to resign from my job. I, in fact, I was sent home on the day. And anyway, the right wing press went mad because essentially they felt that a teacher was telling the truth and was suspended for it. In the end, I had to resign. And then I was told generally by everyone that I would never work in the state sector again. Mm because I had sided with the right, you know, that was the problem. If I'd said the same kinds of things, perhaps at um, an NUT, com you know, conference, it might've been acceptable, but I had said it at a conservative party conference and that was simply unacceptable and nobody would touch me. And so then I thought, well, I could work in the private sector, but I didn't really want to work in the private sector. I'd always worked with, not just in the state sector, but with disadvantaged kids in the inner city. It's what I love and it's what I do best. And so I thought I better set up a free school because that would be the only way that I could continue. And so, yes, it did ruin my life because for three years I was without the kind of job that, you know, paid my mortgage and all that kind of thing. I, I managed to write for the Telegraph and I did what I had to do to survive and I had savings and things, but um, I never really knew whether or not I was going to be okay because... Well, what if I hadn't succeeded? Mm. You know, and there were a lot of people who hated me. Uh, people would protest at our events when we were trying to open. We tried to open in Brixton. We tried to open in Wandsworth. We eventually ended up in Brent. I really, to this day, you know, it's only by the grace of God, really, that we managed to find. There are lots of schools, free schools that didn't open, you know, because the the detractors are quite powerful mm. and in stopping you. And, and um, you know, what they would do is we'd have a parents' evening and they would infiltrate and they would position themselves throughout amongst parents. So you'd get like single black mums there wanting a new school and an opportunity to be able to give something different to their child. And then you'd have all these white middle class people jumping up in the middle of it, shouting at me <laughs> saying, you're a Tory teacher. You betrayed us the day you went to the Conservative Party conference. And I'd be thinking, betrayed you? Who are you? <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> I just want to set up a school. Just leave me alone. Yeah. And even when we opened, we had people protesting outside. Uh, yeah. They would break onto the site and, and take photographs of things. They would give out literature to the parents and to the kids saying that the school was a health and safety hazard. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I've had death threats. I've had threats of um, all sorts of violent behavior and how they're going to get me. And these are emails to the school. This is through Twitter. This is once somebody broke into my email account and sent out the most vile racist stuff to all of my address book. Oh. I mean, honestly, I, <laughs> like, and I kept thinking, you know, it feels like we're building nuclear arms. Yeah. All we're wanting to do is, is open a school. Like, but I think the, that actually, that story, not, not only what happened in response to the speech, which was nuts in itself, mm -hmm. um, and would have been a million times worse if social media had been in its real yes, element back exactly. then. Exactly. I was have been very a lot, lucky lot because there was no Twitter. You're right. So, uh, first, there's the response to the speech which is kind of crazy and then as you say you set up this free school you have these discussions about setting it up in uh, 2013 2014 I guess and the reaction if anything intensifies so what have you learned through that process about what some people refer to as the education blob or the education establishment and and its unwillingness to have yeah its commandments questioned and its its approach to children questioned yeah. because it does suggest that a, an establishment which ought to be pretty open-minded and yes. open to thinking and discussing and changing is actually incredibly closed and quite suspicious of new ideas yeah that's right so in 2010 when i went along and gave that speech i did know i was being naughty but i had no idea what the reaction would be i mean i just I, and and I, I, I'm, I'm, I continue to be stunned. And it's what you said about the unwillingness to even listen and, mm. and, and change. Now, that isn't everybody. Yep. And, and what's great is that there are a lot of teachers out there, individual teachers who say, follow me on Twitter and read my stuff and hear what I say and are listening and are changing. But the establishment uh, won't listen and will shut out anybody who tries to challenge it. And that I learned through my experience of giving that speech and then spending three years trying to set up uh, the school. Now, we have managed to do it uh, amazingly. 
I suppose, because I'm a dog with a bone and I, and I just kept going. And like my number one piece of advice I say to anybody who ever asked me, young teachers who are saying they can't find a job or people who want promotions or whatever, it doesn't matter what field you're in. My advice to everyone is just keep going. Mm. Whatever they throw at you, you just need to keep going, which is what I did. And it has taken many, many years. I mean, it, you know, it, it's now 2019. We are coming up to, so on Thursday, we get to, in two days, we get our, our first set of GCSE results. Right. And then I gave that speech in 2010. So this is nine years ago. You know, this is, this has been a long journey, but I do feel that in order to change, because the establishment is so willing to, un to listen, unwilling to listen, I do feel that this is a, a, a fight that will take decades. Mm. Um, and, and to the point where I think that actually it, it, we won't see it achieved in my lifetime. I feel like it's one of those things where you, you, you pass the baton on. And, and to somebody else and in a hundred years or whatever it is, we'll, we'll get it to where it needs to be. I won't be there to see it. So, so let's talk a bit about what that achievement might be in terms of yeah. what you, you want to achieve and other people too. As you say, there are individual voices and other people in the education system who have similar mm -hmm. concerns to yours. Yeah. Because I've always thought that the reason there was such a rash response to you is uh, I think if it had been a posh private school teacher from Eton or Harrow or somewhere standing up at the Tory party conference and saying, we must raise standards and teach Latin and all yes. that stuff. It would have been okay. It yes. would have been like, that's what happens. But because you were that's someone right. who had taught disadvantaged children that's right. in, in a city schools, and you had that great line in your speech about how the education system keeps poor children poor. Mm -hmm. And so your focus was obviously on those sections of society who you argued had been catastrophically let down by mm -hmm. the low standards and the ill discipline in the education system. And I think that's why there was this furious that's response. Right. So if you could just describe for us, in what ways do you think the education system at large lets down working class or disadvantaged children in particular? Yeah. I mean, just before I say that, I, just to add to what you said, I think it's it's also about what I look like. I mean, in terms of race and so on. Mm. I think the fact that a black woman who was educated herself in the state sector, who's always worked with disadvantaged kids in the inner city, is not allowed to say these kinds no. of things <laughs> because I owe the establishment. They feel I owe, yeah. you know, especially as I'm, I'm accusing the left and leftist ideas. The left is, is saying, Listen, mate, do you not realize who's been on your side all these years? We're <laughs> the ones that have helped you and your family and your ancestors and so on. We're mm -hmm. the ones that have fought for you. And then you turn around and think for yourself and mm -hmm. come up with these ideas. You must be joking. You have to think the way we think. And that, that, that is the thing Absolutely. that really galls them. They can't stand it. It's like you, it's what you just said. Had I been some white public school, but you know, blah, blah, they wouldn't care. Yeah. It's the lack of gratitude. They, they feel that my thinking for myself demonstrates a lack of gratitude. Now, in terms of what I've seen, What's important to recognize is that when I first went into teaching, I thought like most, like all lefty teachers, you know, I, I thought it was about a lack of money. I thought there was a huge reason why uh, kids were failing. I thought there was loads of institutionalized racism. So that's why black kids, for instance, weren't doing as well. I just thought all the standard stuff that everybody thinks. It was only through the years of teaching <laughs> that I came to realize that things were not the way I thought when I first arrived. Mm. And I'm open-minded. So I changed my mind. And... What I came to realize was that the big thing is the poor discipline. So kids are just going crazy in schools. And, <laughs> you know, people, so many times I've been interviewed by people in the press and they say, but what do you mean? You know, things are fine. My son is at a state school and he's just fine. And I say, how do you know? He comes home from school and you say, how was your day? And he says, fine. And then he goes to his room. How do you know? What do you actually know about what's going on in your child's classroom? And then they would shrug their shoulders and say, well, you're right, actually. I have no mm. idea why they, whether or not they're, they're, they're getting a good education. And obviously, there's a, a huge range of schools out there as well. So if you're in some middle class area with, you know, parents who, you know, mom picks them up because she's at home all day or whatever it is, then it might be very different. Having said that, I think throughout our school system, discipline is nowhere near as good as it could be. Bullying is something that's just accepted as a norm. Um, and actually, you don't have to have that in your school. You just need to have discipline. And what that means is having, for instance, uniform. If you ever see, uh, you know, Grange Hill from my day, I don't know what the equivalent is these <laughs> days, but, you know, these school uh, schools that are featured on in movies and television, the kids' ties are always down here and the shirts are untucked and they're yeah. all kind of super cool. 
Well, why do they have to look like that? Why don't they have the ties tied to the top? Like, that's all you have to do is have, is, is insist on their ties being tied to the top. And the reason why you have a uniform, I mean, one, it brings you all together. You're all part of the same thing. And it's this wonderful group mentality idea that, you know, we represent the school. But the other reason is so that they can rebel. So they pull their tie down to rebel instead of carrying knives, for instance. The, the tighter you are in terms of your discipline, the less likely you are right, to have the right. big things happen. So when people come to visit us and they say, well, what do you do when a child tells you to F off? Or what do you do when a child just marches out of the lesson? Or what do you do when the kid just punches another kid in the classroom? And I say, that doesn't happen. <laughs> and they say, but you know, it must happen because you've got challenging kids from challenging area, et cetera. And we do very challenging inner city situation just to describe for your listeners so that they know, you know, my, my staff all have to go outside after school because uh, we have to deal with the situation of what might happen between the various different schools. Uh, boys will turn up on bikes with masks, with knives, waiting for our boys. Uh, we had a year 11 boy. We, we had they, they took their exams. They came out. A whole bunch of boys from another school rushed him and stabbed him with a compass. This is, this is standard kind of behavior in, in the inner city. So we have a challenging intake. And when you have that, you have to uh, address that issue. That doesn't mean these kids can't behave. You just need to know your clientele mm -hmm. and know what to provide them with. If you came and asked them, you came to the school, you spoke to the kids. If you ask them, they'll all say it's a strict school. Yeah, but we love it. And we love it because it keeps us safe because we're able to sit in our lessons and put our hands up and know that we're not going to be laughed at by, uh, by the other kids in the, in, in the class. It, it's the teacher who's in charge at Michaela in the classroom, yeah. not the, the kid who's the bully because somebody's got to be in charge. And if it isn't the yeah. teacher, I guarantee you it's the bad boy. And if it's the bad boy who's in charge, nobody's got the backbone to put their hand up, right? Because they know they're going to get beaten up or laughed at by the group of kids who are actually controlling that classroom. Mm. That's bad. In every single classroom in Michaela, the teacher's in charge, the school is in charge, and the children feel safe, both to be able to answer questions and to be able to go to the toilet. Do you know, in many schools in challenging areas, children will train themselves not to go to the toilet all day. And that is because they're so terrified of going to the toilet because they know that that's where they'll get hit. Mm. And when I say hit, you know, somebody's going to attack them, somebody's going to laugh, somebody's going to do something to them. It's, the, it's, it's, it's awful. And so they don't go to the toilet all day. Our kids can go to the toilet. So the, the that's very good. If kids, <laughs> a school in which kids can go to the toilet is a very good school. Um, the one thing, I, I've always been really interested in your elevation of, of discipline as one of the core issues at a school. And I went to a fairly disciplinarian school, Catholic school, mm -hmm. uh, run by nuns. So it was quite strict. And we had very strict uniform code. And you would be punished if your uniform wasn't up to scratch or if it was slightly the wrong shade of grey in your trousers or whatever else right. it might be. And what was notable about my school is that in most classrooms, the teacher was in charge, but there were notable exceptions where right. the teacher couldn't be in charge. And as you say, it's exactly as you describe, someone else would take over yeah. or some other group would take over. But, but I wanted to ask you in relation to discipline, which you talk about a lot, and I want to ask you a few questions about Michaela's discipline as well. But what do you see as the relationship between discipline and educational standards uh, are they intimately related or do you need to have discipline in order to keep order and then in addition to that a whole different approach to standards or is that do they come as a no, package they're connected and so and, and 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 what's key okay so first of all obviously if you have chaos in the in the school however good your teachers are they're not yeah they can't do it i mean you've got to have systems from the top that are going to support your teachers but then there's the second point which is that you can't go around acting like bouncers to get the kids to behave and think, yeah, we're in charge and we're going to give you detentions. Blah, blah, blah. Because <laughs> the thing is, is that there's more of them than there are of us, mm. right? So you've got to have buy-in from the majority of kids. Your detentions only keeps 10, 15% on the outside in line, right? You've got to have the tipping point of the majority and you get the tipping point of the majority by teaching them well, right? right. Because if you don't teach them well and they're not learning anything, then they're not going to accept the discipline. Mm. So while the kids will say, yeah, 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 we feel really safe and so on, they'll also say, we learn loads and we know so much more than our friends go to other schools. And when I was at primary school, I learned something, but then I came here and wow, look how clever I am here. This is the key thing. They need to feel clever. So you see where 
more left-leaning people get it wrong is that they talk about self-esteem yeah. and let's do <laughs> self-esteem classes and, and, and let's make everybody feel good about themselves by giving everybody a prize and never making, n- never saying that you're better than so-and-so and everybody's just wonderful and we love you all. And while that makes the teachers feel good, it doesn't actually make the kids feel good because they're not dumb. They know if everybody gets a certificate that their certificate is meaningless, right? Yeah. <laughs> so they don't want a meaningless certificate. What they want is to learn and to feel accomplished. And the way you learn and feel accomplished is to be in a nice, safe classroom where you're able to think, where you're able to answer, where you're able to have class discussions and where the teacher is leading the learning. That makes the child feel successful. And when he feels successful, he buys into the whole system. So he wants to behave because he learns. Mm. And that's what he comes to. Every child goes to school to learn, right? There's no question. No matter how badly behaved the kid was before, I don't care what special needs they have. Every child goes to school to learn, but they're children. And as with all children, they'll push because that's what they do. And that's what makes them cute. That's <laughs> nice, right? It's the same with two-year-olds, you know? They run around, they pretend they're over. Oh, no, did I, you know, like, that's what they, this is what kids do. Yeah. It's our job to push back. That's what we're meant to do. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean punching them in the face, right? That's not what discipline is. It means being very clear with the kids. Look, if you decide to do the right thing, you're going to get a merit. If you decide to do the the wrong thing, you're going to get a demerit. So it's really important while you have your demerits and your detentions to also have the praise on the other side. So we've got a whole merit demerit system and the kids get rewarded. They get a reward event at the end of the half term where they get to watch a film and eat cookies and, and, and eat popcorn together. And they all want to be in that. So they want to build up their merits to get in there. I mean, it's, it's actually kind of simple. It's just that you see, and, and most all schools will have a merit system or a point system or something. The thing is, is that you have to get consistency throughout the school Mm. from the top, right? And so, and that's the hard thing to achieve in any organization. It could be, you know, Apple selling its computers, doesn't matter, right? Whatever the organization, you have got to have consistency. And when you have consistency, you will have success. And that's very hard to achieve in a school. And it requires a lot of over narration. It requires uh, the head being in school all the time. I meet with my senior team every morning at 7 a.m. And we discuss the things that went wrong the day before. And then we think, what do we need? How do we need to react to that today? And so we, we react constantly to things that are happening and we're on it. Elsewhere, you might find senior teams meet once a week and the deputies will come along with a presentation mm. to give to the whole group. I mean, I don't understand what the point of that is. I mean, <laughs> what, why are you, what? Like, I don't, I do not understand it. The whole point of meeting is to be able to react to the things that are going on in the school immediately. And that's the other thing that people need to understand is that children love immediacy. So people like they have these things where there's like Friday detention and kids show up to Friday detention. They got booked in on Monday or maybe they even worse. They got booked in the week before and kids are rolling up to detention. Like, why are you here, man? Don't know. Why are you here? Don't know. Right. Well, let's just sit down and get our detention over. And they have no idea why they're there because they can't remember. It has to be then right there on the day. If you don't do it immediately, you might as well not do it at all. And so I have been doing this for a very long time, right? I mean, I've always been in teaching. I know kids. I know schools. I'm also obsessed with education. I've been to visit schools everywhere from China to India to, I don't know, Jamaica to, I don't know, New York. I mean, France, wherever, you name it. If I've been there, I've been to a school there. I'm obsessed with reading about it and thinking about it. And so I really understand it. What I've made sure has happened at school is that everybody else you know, here's the ideas and we talk about the ideas. See, that might might not happen in another school necessarily. So we meet as a staff body once a week and we talk about ideas, Mm. intellectual ideas. It's a very intellectual place, Michaela. And we have discussions about philosophy, um, about politics, about, you know, why do kids behave like this? You know, what's the best way to react to this? As opposed to, I don't know, having meetings about health and safety. That kind of thing happens all the time in other schools. (laughs) You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. If you like this podcast and Spike's other podcasts, and also the articles and essays that Spike publishes every day, please think about giving us a donation. Spike's content is free and we want to keep it free, and donations really help us to do that. 
head over to Spike's donation page now at www.spiked-online.com. When I was at Michaela, we did one of these discussions on a political discussion on the welfare state and the impact it has on family life and community life. It was a brilliant discussion. But I wanted to ask you, as you were speaking there, you used that phrase push back, push back against Mm. children. And the, the, the thing that it really sounds like you guys are doing is asserting adult authority in relation to children. And I think I wanted to ask you about the broader crisis of discipline in schools, because I think it's very interesting. I don't think it's simply down to, I don't know, a new generation of teachers who are a bit too trendy and a bit too relaxed. I think the the rise of the cult of self-esteem is a very clear symptom of the problem. But I wonder if the broader problem is an erosion of adult authority so that yeah. we've arrived at a situation where even the, the one institution in society where adult authority is essential, well, the family is one, but then mm-hmm. there's also the school system mm-hmm. where it really doesn't work unless yeah. there is adult authority in the sense of knowing your subject and wanting to teach it and knowing that you're in charge and you want to take control of children who are screwing around. So what do you think has brought about that collapse of adult authorities to such an extent that the kind of thing you're now describing which is basically pushing back against children when they try and push Hmm. sounds very radical yeah whereas 50 60 70 years ago it was normal so what went wrong well and it's not just about so when you say about the family that's really important so the family has been undermined schools have been undermined because Mm. adults have been undermined because the idea is that everything needs to be child-centered and this is where teaching is important because we teach them we lead the learning i always say it's the teacher who's driving the bus the children are in the bus and the teacher decides where they're going too often it's the child who is told to decide so if you look at a reception class there'll be various different uh, stations there's one with toilet roll holders you know that they make things with and then there's lego over there and there's building blocks here and they decide where they're going as opposed to the teacher leading it right Uh, The same thing happens in secondary school and children are put in groups. The teacher is the facilitator of learning, moving amongst the groups, keeping them on task as they Mm -hmm. lead their own learning. And the same happens in families. So parents have lost their authority. They are not, the children aren't inspired to do what their parents are asking them to do because there's a lack of respect and there's a lack of respect for authority. And they don't see their parents as an authority. They don't see the teachers as an authority. And the whole of society kind of denigrates the concept of authority. I mean, I just read this morning about how they're telling parents that when results come out on Thursday for GCSEs, that they should not brag on social media. So, you know, you've got your Facebook group with your friends and aunties and uncles. You want to be able to say, little Johnny got five A stars. Well, nowadays it's nines and eights, but anyway, you know, he got, you know, these results and isn't it wonderful? And I'm so proud of him. They're saying, don't do that because this will affect the mental health and (laughs) self-esteem of other children. (laughs) What? Like, this is crazy. So you're not even able to celebrate your own child's achievements. And that is the culture in society. So it's not just about schools at all. Schools, it, when they're trying, because we're not the only ones who are trying to stand against this, this culture, but those schools who are trying to stand against this culture are fighting everybody. Mm. They're fighting the parents. They're fighting the whole of society. And the parents themselves don't know that they are victims of this kind of culture, right? And they don't know that the reason why their children aren't listening to them is because they've allowed themselves to become those victims. And the problem is, I mean, I say this to friends of mine, for instance, when their four-year-old or five-year-old is acting up and refusing to do what they want. And they say, okay, look, here, have a cookie. Oh, here, just do what I say. Do, you know, here, you, you get what you want, do whatever you want, and, it's, and, and, and just do what I say, and then it'll be all right. And I'm always saying, one day he's going to be bigger than you. What are you <laughs> going to do then, right? You have got to instill a culture of respect where yeah. your child does what you want because they respect you. I mean, there are many people who would just say what I've just said. Do what you want. Listen to what she's saying. She thinks that the adult should tell the child what to do. Well, yeah, of course, (laughs) the adult should tell the child what to do. I mean, the child is a child and they are depending on us to help them get to where they need to go, right? And if we don't do that, we are letting them down because if they choose what they really want, well, they'll be on their Xboxes and their PSPs playing all day. They are not going to see the beauty of the world because they won't be given the 
the knowledge and the experience which mm. will allow them to enter a world of a higher that's of a higher level right it is just at a higher level and um even that what i'm saying people say is controversial you know how can you say that uh, mozart is better than stormzy i'm constantly having this conversation on twitter yeah. like what do you mean isn't it just obvious that mozart is better than stormzy and i'm not saying that stormzy isn't a good guy <laughs> you know i have huge respect for him he's made a real you know success of his life i'm i'm so pleased for him i'm pleased people buy his music and enjoy it and that's really great but he's not mozart and you know, I am certain that even Stormzy would say he's not Mozart. <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. And yet, I'm having to argue this all the time. And then they're spending time in their music lessons teaching Stormzy when they would be listening to Stormzy outside anyway. Why not expose them to Beethoven and to Bach and so on? Artists that they would never have have, have ever heard of, right? They wouldn't know anything about. I once gave an assembly about Beethoven and I was talking about how difficult it was for them growing up nowadays with all the kind of uh, drill music and so on that exists nowadays. Whereas when I was growing up, it was Kylie Minogue. That was the most exciting thing that there was. <laughs> and then later when I was eating lunch with them, it turns out that they thought Kylie and Beethoven were contemporaries. You know, wow. they had no idea. And I even had a picture of Beethoven up with his wig and everything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because kids don't know unless you tell them, right? That's actually a really good point. And I actually wanted to ask you about Mozart versus Stormzy, because right, I right, think that's right, a fascinating, right. revealing discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think it all taps into the broader collapse of authority, because not only does that impact on whether you can tell a child off or lead a child in a particular direction and make sure that they're well behaved, but it also impacts on the basic ability to make educational judgment and yeah. moral judgment. That's right. And to say that this thing is better than that thing. That's right. And therefore you should learn about it and you should read it. And so you see these discussions coming up all the time now where you'll actually hear teachers themselves saying, well, kids can't relate to Shakespeare or Mozart and Beethoven's music is too alien to them. And therefore what's okay. the point in teaching it? So all of that, I think, springs from and then exacerbates the broader inability of adult society to say, this is what is wonderful mm -hmm. from history and mm -hmm. from the from the banks of cultural knowledge. Yeah. And we're going to transmit it to you, the new generation, because we are taking some responsibility for your lives. And so yeah. a, a really important thing, which Hannah Arendt wrote about, the, the transmission of knowledge from one generation to the next being, in many ways, the key responsibility of adult society. Mm -hmm. When that breaks down and is no longer done, mm -hmm. it does raise questions about what the future will look like. And that's what's quite interesting because, you know, I mean, I, I would say I'm a small C conservative and I would say I lean to the right. However, a lot of my thoughts are quite left leaning and my motivations here are left leaning. Mm. My motivations are about social justice, right? I want social justice for these kids. Somebody like Roger Scruton, for instance, who is very much a conservative and more of a conservative than I am, would say that the role of education uh, is not to impart social justice. I mean, he wouldn't even recognize the concept of social justice. He would say the role of education is to give knowledge to the next generation so that, you know, it, it benefits your country and that the next generation has the knowledge that they need in order to better the country, and they will pass it on to the next generation and so on. And of course, I agree with him, and I believe in all of that, but there's something additional in that for me, which is that I'm trying to give disadvantaged kids uh, a chance in life. And what the left-leaning people don't understand is that they are ruining these children's lives mm. with their nonsense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, they are. And, and, and the thing is, is that they might feel really good about themselves sitting at dinner parties and saying, oh, you know, I'm so wonderful because I vote for Corbyn and all this kind of nonsense. And that's, that, that's what they like. They like feeling good about themselves. And so they say, oh, I don't believe in detentions. I believe in restorative justice and all sorts of nonsense. What that is, is you have a chat with the kid uh, and restore justice as opposed to <laughs> giving them a detention. I mean, what is a detention after all? 20, 30 minutes, sit mm. down, you do some work that would be like homework. I mean, it's not the homework of the day, but you do work that makes you cleverer and then you go home whoop they do <laughs> like what is the big deal but apparently you know this is to be this is cruelty to children i mean i have read some crazy stuff about me just the other day i was reading on on twitter this woman talking about me saying that because i'm i mean all of this is totally untrue she said that my family were from were indian from uganda and uh because of the terrible things that idi amin did i 
had had have a, have, a, have a real problem with black people, oh, and because wow. the kids at my school are black, I'm now punishing them through giving them detentions. I mean, it was the most. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> They're crazy. These people are crazy. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, ultimately, you come to the school, you see a bunch of happy kids who love their school, who are learning loads because we are leading the learning because we've got great discipline. We teach them gratitude so that no matter how hard your life is, you are grateful for what you've got so you can make something of yourself. Mm. You know, one of the big problems for kids who are disadvantaged is that everybody tells them that they're disadvantaged all of the time and they go around feeling hard done by. Oh, it's really hard for me because I'm black. Oh, it's really hard for me because, I, you know, I, I've got a single mom and I live in an estate or I never see my dad or my dad's in prison or whatever it is. And because of that, they go around with this chip on their shoulder, feeling that the world's against them. And if the world is against you, how are you then meant yeah. to play a part in that world? How are you meant to make your plans to get into university? Because, well, university is never going to have you because they're all white, aren't they? And they're yeah. all going to racially oppress me and they're never going to let me in anyway. And I'm never going to get that job because those white guys are never going to let me on because I'm black and I'm female and whatever. It, even if it were all true, right? even <laughs> yeah. if it were all true, if you think like that, the fact is you will never make anything of yourself. So our thing is we are lucky and we are lucky, you know. I mean, objectively speaking, I think we are lucky. These kids get a free education, which is, I think, the best education you're ever going to find, right? And they, they, they come there, they get this amazing education. I mean, yes, we don't have the best facilities. Yes, they don't have any grass to play on. Yes, there are no trees. Yes, there's no sports hole. There's all sorts of things that I would love to change, right? But we get a good basic education, really good value. And if you are hardworking, you can come to Michaela and you can make something of your life. And Britain is such, I mean, you said you wanted to talk about race. Britain is, is a very different place to the way it was 50 years ago in terms of race. Big, big time, right? And you can make it. You can if you work hard and, and do all the things that we're telling you to do. Now, the problem that kids might have from the inner city who aren't in a school like that is that they're not able to because they're in chaotic classrooms. And so it's impossible to move away from the pull of the street, right? Mm. They wonder why kids get involved in gangs and why kids are carrying knives. Well, I'll tell them it's bloody obvious, right? It's obvious because they're not being given an education. If you're giving these kids an education, if we're all, you know, people laugh at me and say, oh, let's sing together and sing the knives off the streets. Well, yeah. That is how you do it, actually. <laughs> you know, if you all sing together, sing God Save the Queen and Jerusalem and I Vow to Thee My Country and feel British together and feel like you belong to your country as opposed to that country's white and I'm not part of it and I'm really Jamaican. And when, when they talk, if they say I'm Jamaican instead of I'm British, right? That's a big thing, right? When the World Cup happened, we had all our English flags out. We were all like, go England, go England, go England because we are here. This is where we live. This is where we belong. And if we don't, if we don't feel like that, right? If the kids don't feel like that, how are they meant to succeed? Now, that is one of the most shocking things that people, teachers find. If they come and find us singing, you know, I vow to thee my country, you know, they look at me and go, yeah. what? You know, how can you be doing this? It's all the more <laughs> crucial that we do it because we're in the inner city, because we got, you know, kids of all different kinds of colors. And the one thing that binds us, they're different religions, they're different colors, different backgrounds, etc. The one thing that binds us is that we are all British together, mm. right? I don't want the kids, you know, supporting Colombia. For instance, when Colombia were, were you know, <laughs> It, they, they, they might, I mean, not at Michaela, but elsewhere, they would support Colombia because Colombia is seen as, as the black country, yeah. right? And because it's black, I mean, I, 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 you can't, your listeners can't see me putting Quite fingers. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, inverted commas here, but uh, because it's black, they therefore, they'll always support the blackest country against England, right? And that's wrong. And that's because they are identifying first as being black as opposed to yeah. first identifying as British. That is a really useful point. And yeah. I want to draw out a couple of things in relation to that, because I think that's kind of really hit the nail on the head in relation to the absence of social glue and the impact that has on exactly. how kids conceive of themselves and how mm. institutions themselves operate. Yeah. But I wanted to just come back to one of the points you made there about the left-leaning motivation behind some of what you do. Because I, I yeah. think I really get that. And I, I always think that there is a, there's a naturally conservative, small-c conservative component to education, which is that you are conserving knowledge and you're passing it on. So there's always that element to it. But I well, think... Well, no. no. No, 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 no. Let me just take, take that apart. Because that is not what education is about anymore, right? <laughs> oh, not, not now. I mean, the point is, is that 
leftists see education as a tool to revolutionize everybody yeah. and to turn them all into revolutionaries as opposed to giving them knowledge so that they can make that decision yes. for themselves. I, Up to me, as far as I'm concerned, some of our kids will become, you know, dentists and bankers and doctors and lawyers and that kind of thing. And they'll lead kind of very ordinary and straightforward and somewhat boring lives. And then there will be others who will become revolutionaries. And some might join the Labour Party and do whatever. I don't really care. The fact is that I am giving them a basic education and an ability to think for themselves in a critical fashion so that they can decide what kind of life they want to lead. Whereas too many people in education think that it is their role to revolutionize these kids so that they can come out. And why is it that Corbyn is supported mainly by the youth? Because they've all come out as revolutionaries, right? And there's something wrong with an education system when we're pumping out only revolutionaries. We should be pumping out a variety of different children. In relation to that point, and also when you talk about the social justice side to this, not, not the NAF social justice idea, but the idea that it's good to help disadvantaged kids and inner city kids and so on give them equality of opportunity yes and i've always thought that one of the one of the most striking things about the new approach to education which says well let them listen to stormzy or you know let's not have so many shakespeare texts let's let them read i don't know Anne frank's diary which i think it is important to read but not just that to the exclusion of everything else that presents itself as this kind of very chilled out pro-child, you know, progressive approach to education, but it actually has a very elitist component because what they're really saying is black kids won't get Shakespeare. That's right. Indian kids can't appreciate Mozart really because it's so distant from their racial reality or their cultural reality or their background. So um, I've often thought that there's a classist, racist, certainly elitist component to this supposedly progressive approach which actually ends up saying poor kids can't cope with high knowledge and therefore let's give them any old crap that's right it's everything you just said elitist and racist and prejudice right. <laughs> and all of that and those people don't realize that that's what they are mm. and i'm always saying we need to call them out we need to say what they are and the problem is is that it's the right wingers who agree with me on my position in education and right wingers like to deny that there's any such thing as racism. Yeah. And so they refuse, yeah. they refuse to call it what it is, which is racist, right? That is what these people are. They are denying a decent education to black kids, right? Because being able to understand Shakespeare is a right <laughs> that <laughs> my kids deserve, <laughs> right? And knowing who Mozart was and hearing his music is a right that they should be able to access not being shown Stormzy, who they know anyway. The point <laughs> is, is that they're going to access this stuff on their own. So why would we spend our time on that, right? Mm. There's so little time in terms of the curriculum to what, what you're going to be able to give them. And this is all about race. So when I say it's all about race, Stormzy's black, Mozart's white. Mm. In fact, Mozart is a dead white man. Yeah. And anybody who's a dead white man Bad is news. what, you know, they don't want to do, they don't want to teach dead white men, right? So... They're desperate to get away from the dead white man, Shakespeare. Oh, what does he have in common with Mozart? Oh, they're both dead white men, right? (laughs) So they don't like it. And it's because they feel, I mean, to a certain extent, look, I mean, I get angry and I say, yeah, they're a bunch of racists. But then on the other hand, I think, well, they're actually victims of the kind of racist conversation that's being had all the time. Because if you're a little white teacher who's just come in, I say little, I mean, I don't mean little, I mean young. Um, You know, you're a young white teacher, you're 23, you love kids. You want to do what's right. In fact, I was having a conversation like this on Twitter the other day with this woman who was so lovely. And she was saying, I don't want to be racist. I want to do the right thing. I'm just, I just want to do what I don't want to be. So tell me what to do. <laughs> and, um, and the problem is, is that all she's hearing is, if you teach Mozart, yeah, you're racist. Yeah. Whereas if you teach Stormzy, you're right on. Yeah. You're really with it. And so she thinks, okay, fine, I- I'll-, I'll do what you want. I- I'll teach Benjamin Zephaniah. I'll teach Stormzy. Tell me what to do. I'll do whatever you want. Just don't call me racist. That's what's going on. So they are victims. It's it's the establishment, the people with power. So it's mm. the politicians who I hold responsible for this because they are older and wiser and they should know better. And there are certain people who uh, push that race, race agenda for their own benefit. So they know it benefits their own careers. So they keep on stoking that because they know it's going to help them. And they don't really care whether it ruins the, the lives of black inner city boys who end up carrying knives because of what they're saying. That's what they don't realize is that there is this butterfly, you know, when a butterfly bats its wings or whatever, mm. there's a tornado or whatever it is on the other side yeah. of the world or something like that. <laughs> so that's what happens. They are saying that stuff up in the media 
and it trickles down and it means black boys carrying knives. That is what goes on. I think I actually agree with that. And I think it's what's interesting and you you touched on this earlier is the the fatalism of the new discussion around race because what it does and the reason you can have this butterfly effect between these kind of policies which say let them listen to Stormzy and then this kind of sense of disarray in certain communities especially inner city communities uh, it is it the reason i think there is a connection there is because what the new race discussion does or the ideology of multiculturalism in terms of how it communicates to communities it says to them as you were saying earlier on you're black and therefore you have loads of problems this is a racist society the mainstream doesn't like you very much most white people are racist they're Mm -hmm. islamophobic they Mm -hmm. don't understand your culture Mm -hmm. and it creates this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy in many ways where these kids will go through life thinking what's the point? I can't mm-hmm. push back against this on my own. Mm-hmm. It's really difficult. And self-pity mm-hmm. takes over from self-drive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think this is one of the terrible ironies of the supposedly progressive multicultural agenda. It ends up being as much of a prison for black kids as old-fashioned racism used to be, where there were actual stop signs saying, well, you can't come to this university well, or I you can't have this job. Uh, it could be even worse. I, yeah. And the reason why it's worse is because... They're enslaved in the mind. You know, it was easier to fight the kind of racism that existed in Martin Luther King's day because it was just obvious. Those are the bad guys who aren't (laughs) letting us use the toilets or whatever it is. So we have to march and we have to do X, Y, and Z to stop that from happening. And we need to change things. Nowadays, here I am. Okay, so I'm trying to persuade white people that the racism of yesteryear is not the racism that's the most difficult now. It's actually the racism that they themselves are participating in because they've listened to the nonsense that often black people are telling them to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and then I have to try and persuade the black people or the kids, okay, look, you know, you need to be grateful. And so we we need to work hard and that's how you're going to succeed and stop being self-pitying and so on. Even though there's the media who's telling you otherwise that you can never succeed. Don't listen to them. Like it's, it's very, it's a, it's a complex fight. It's very, very hard to win this. This is why I say it's decades long and won't happen until way after I'm long gone, you know, in terms of winning. And I don't even know if it can be won. It's, it's very, very hard. It, it wasn't hard before. And that's not to, you know, obviously insult the terrible thing, you know, the people who fought for uh, race equality in the day. Mm. Obviously, there were terrible things that went on and, you know, I have huge respect for them. But the fight is much more difficult now because people don't realize, people think that they're helping them. There's a great book by Jason Riley, who's a African-American. It's called Please Stop Helping Us. Um, <laughs> and uh, he's talking to the white liberal left and yeah. he's saying, look, your help is actually hurting us and you need to stop. And I get all my staff to read it, you know, because it's so important for for them to realize that if you want to help black kids, you, you got to do it very differently than from what the establishment is telling you to do right now. Yeah, I think that shift, one of the great tragedies of modern times, socially speaking, politically speaking, has been the shift from you know, the campaign for racial equality and for greater autonomy towards Mm. this kind of cult of racial victimhood, which comes from the establishment through the education system in universities and so on. Uh, And that has a really, I think, denigrating impact on communities. I want to talk a bit bit about some of the solutions to that, which you've already touched upon, which is, you know, this sense of creating a sense of social solidarity and particularly national solidarity, because we talk about, we've just been talking about things that we don't think are particularly controversial Mm. and wouldn't have been 40 or 50 years ago. Mm. Another one we can add to the list is the sense that it's good to be part of a nation. It's good to feel connected to, to have a a national identity. Not that that would mean you would become a nationalist and, and, you know, a skinhead and, and attack people who don't belong or any of that nonsense but a sense that there is something outside of yourself, bigger than yourself, and it would be good to aspire to belong to that. Uh, Do you think that one of the broader problems we face is that the culture now says to kids all the time, go into your own community, go into your own culture, sink back into your own supposed background, rather than come with us on this national project? That's right. So people are really ashamed to be British. 
Um, they don't want to admit it. During the World Cup, you know, they had to have England written on the flag. No other flag in the world has to write <laughs> yeah. their country on the flag. Like, that's just weird. <laughs> and that's because that's there is a real shame around the flag. I mean, and... Yeah often kids who are from whose parents are from other countries will identify they'll say oh i'm i'm jamaican or i'm nigerian as opposed to i'm british and their schools their teachers are ashamed of it their teachers are uncomfortable about it i think one of the reasons why with brexit why you see some of the crazy remainers behaving in the way that they are is because the eu gave them the opportunity to identify as european yeah and they didn't then have to identify as british and now if this happens all they're left with is their Britishness, and that makes them feel deep, deep shame. And so then there's lots of, uh, you know, non-white British people who are there going, well, what does that mean for us? You know, because, mm. you know, they're not sure if they're British. And that's because the school system hasn't socialized people into feeling British. And it should. I mean, that should be part of the school system's uh, role, I think, to bring us all together, because there are different levels of groups. So in, you have your nuclear family. Then you might have your larger family and you have your community that you're part of and you're in part of that is your school. Mm. But then you have the larger, you're in your, 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 your town. So you might identify people from Liverpool or very much Liverpoolians. We're all together. They, they, they know when they, you know, when they meet another, you know, someone from Liverpool, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're from the same place. But then there's a bigger thing, which is your country. And there's nothing wrong with the nation state. It's something good to, to value, to being, in being part of that. And we should, as schools, encourage kids to see themselves in that. That's why we sing God Save the Queen and so on, because she's our queen. I have to say, you know, I don't really care about the queen, personally. <laughs> you know, I don't have like, you know, mugs with her picture on it and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I couldn't care less about the queen, but I do care about her because she's a symbol. She's a symbol of us all belonging, right? And it is so important for children who aren't white to feel like they are British. And we take away that right by not socializing them in school. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. Subscribe now so that you never miss an episode. And it would be great if you could give us a rating and maybe even a review that is a really good way to help new listeners discover the show it's almost like there are only two games in town when it comes to young people and how they relate to society it's either white self-loathing or black self-pity and mm. and that's the only options you have so you have all these mm -hmm. particularly you know politically minded young people you'll have all these white people just starting university who will be just coached in this sense of white yeah. shame and national right. shame and beating themselves up over That's their right. history and then you'll have black kids and other kids too who will be coached in this sense of personal victimhood and, right. and history is oppressing me and That's i can't right. walk past this statue of cecil rhodes because it will remind me of what my ancestors went through That's but right. and so and what's important there is that the only way the white person can be considered to be a good person is to feel very very guilty yes and the only way that the black kid can feel like they are being true to themselves and to their people is to feel like a victim yeah. right and it's human nature to want to feel true to yourself and to your people. And it's also human nature to want to feel like you're a good person. And so they are forced down this road, which is just destructive yeah. for both of them. Right. And, and, the, and the white person who goes down that road doesn't understand that their road is further oppressing yes. the black person. <laughs> right. right? And, and it's like, we're in the twilight zone. Yeah. You know, I feel like we're caught in this terrible web. And, and if you try and explain it, you know, this is the problem with Twitter or even being on the radio and so on, you got 30 second soundbite. I can't yeah. explain all of this stuff in 30 seconds, yeah. which is why it's so nice to have conversations yeah. like this. Cause you can actually explore the ideas. It's really hard to explain this sort of stuff. So often on Twitter, I just have to say, sorry, we have different values. There's no point in discussing this because I, I, <laughs> I, I can't do it. I can't do it in, you know, in a tweet. It's impossible. But I think it, it, that, I think that one of the worst things is about that culture is it, it, it's a very symbiotic relationship between these two new approaches to life. So, you know, the, the ashamed white person mm -hmm relies on the kind of yes. lecturing and you know um right. let me educate you of yes. the kind of black activist yes. and then the black activist relies on the self-flagellation right. of the white self-hater in That's order right. to feel like they're so it, there's a pantomime element to it but it's also very destructive but th the one thing i find very interesting i want to get your opinion on the question of history in schools because it mm -hmm. increasingly seems to me that to the extent that schools do teach about britishness it tends to be from a kind of shameful embarrassed 
perspective. And I'm just thinking recently, Sadiq Khan saying there should be a slavery museum in London. Now, I don't have a problem with a slavery museum. There's one in Liverpool. These are good. We need to know this history. But the way he pushes it as a kind of an attempt to educate the public yeah. about how horrible the country they live in I know. really that's is. That's right, that's right. And that's where it becomes problematic. Yeah. So it's not just letting us know what happened in the past, but letting us know that so that we can continue with this that's self-flagellation right. as a nation. That's right, that's right. That's exactly right. Well, in fact, I'm debating reparations, whether reparations for slavery should happen on the 25th of September for Intelligence Squared. And of course, I'm arguing against reparations. And I know that the London crowd who will be in mm. there, I mean... I know they're not on on our side. You know, they are very much uh, because they're all guilty. Yeah. Because they all feel so bad and they want to be good people. And so they vote in a certain manner because they want to be good. They they think the things they do and they don't even know why they think them. They just, I mean, recently, this was all played out on Twitter in in education, actually, because this young white teacher who I know, he uh, published a list of Twitter teachers to follow. So, you know, people he thought were interesting. He put them together on a, and put their pictures on this board or whatever and sent it out to people and said, here you go. This is an interesting list to follow. And he was attacked mercilessly because he didn't have enough BAME people on his list. I mean, here's a guy wow. who just puts together a list of people <laughs> he thinks are interesting to follow. And he's attacked because clearly this was systemic racism at work, he was being told. Because, and he was a racist. He was told he was a white supremacist, <laughs> right? <laughs> because he didn't follow enough. And he had apparently 10 people on there. Then next thing you knew, because there were 10 people on there who were BME, one of, I was one of them, that we weren't black enough. We were only... You know, so I'm light skinned, aren't I? Right. So like, you know, it doesn't matter. Some of my ancestors were slaves, you know, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, it's all just crazy. It is crazy. They're crazy. And you end <laughs> up in the, you end up in, well, they end up in this situation where they think it's progressive and anti-racist. I'm doing inverted quote marks now. To, to encourage people to think racially all the time. I mean, the That's responsibility right. That's right. the responsibility of a decent progressive liberal person 50 years ago was to refuse to think racially and That's to refuse right. to categorize yeah, people yeah, in yeah, that yeah. way and, in fact, to argue for the end of the politics of race. Yeah. Now, yeah. to be a progressive person is to think racially all the time, That's right. to judge people on that level, to engage with them in that That's level. Right. So you either you engage with a black person very apologetically because you're yes. white or, yes. or whatever else. Yes. Uh, and to have this hyper racial consciousness That's right. to such an extent that even if you're drawing up an innocent list of interesting teachers or people, you have to look at the skin color. You have That's to, right. And not even the skin color, it's but awful. the skin shade. It's well, really and what awful. I kept saying was, well, I actually, it prompted me to send out a tweet to all my followers saying, if any of you are following me because I'm black, <laughs> stop following me right <laughs> yeah. now. I mean, who the hell wants to be followed because of your skin color? You want to be admired or respected or whatever, listened to because somebody likes what you have to say, yeah. not because of your skin color. And yet there are black people out there going around telling white people that in order not to be racist, you have to follow black people because of their skin color. It's insane. It's nuts. It's insane. And, but what, I mean, look, you know, I had a DM conversation with uh, one young black woman who's a teacher here in London, you know, back and forth. And in the end, she got what I was saying. You know, she was very much of the point of view of, no, 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 no. But, you know, we've got to, this is the only way black people will achieve. And I was saying, no, that's not the only way. That it isn't a way. That's mm. not success. Yeah. To have a whole load of fake followers on Twitter or only following <laughs> you because you're black, that is not, what is that? That's crazy. Yeah. What you want is to work hard and, 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 and succeed in your own field. And, and that might be more difficult because you're black. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, that's a different conversation, right? Uh, it might be more difficult, but the point is you will get somewhere and you might not get as far perhaps because you're black, but perhaps your son or daughter will, or perhaps mm. your granddaughter, or your grandson will, you know, when I think about my dad, when he came to London, he used to, I remember when I was at university and I was living in a room, I'd gone to Paris, you know, for a year because I did French and, um, and I had a, I had a fridge and he said, you're really lucky. You've got a fridge. He said, when I had a room in London, I didn't have a fridge. I used to have to keep the milk outside on the, on the windowsill to keep it cold. Mm. And in order to find that room, he went through dozens and dozens of places where it said no Irish, no Mm. colored, no dogs and so on, on all, on all the windows. And he couldn't find anywhere to live. Whereas I was able to find somewhere to live and the the, life has changed Mm. radically. And, and my father is able, who's in his eighties now is able to look at me and think, you know, he grew up without any shoes 
in Guyana, poor, really poor. And he was the one out of all his eight brothers and sisters that got him to university, you know, because everybody puts money together and they and they, they find one of them to be able to get to get get one of them out. And he got to he got out and he went to Kingston, Jamaica, which is where he met my mother, and went to university. And then he got to England. And then eventually he moved to Canada. And at that point in Canada, he brought the rest of his family over. Because mm. that is what you do, mm. right? Because he owed them. And and then he has children and his daughter gets to go to Oxford University. You know? Mm. Like it's over generations yeah. that you, 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 you change things through hard work. It, you don't change things by campaigning on Twitter to force some white teacher to put some black faces on his Twitter list. You know, I, I, and, and part of it is kind of the ease of the modern age, the mm. social media, the, the instant expectations of things that we have. Whereas my father doesn't think like that, you know, and my father in the next few years, I suppose he'll die at some point. And he will die a happy man because he lived a successful life. And he didn't, the man doesn't even know what Twitter is. You know? <laughs> Good for him. Yeah. But I think the, the, those kind of stories are really interesting and important because I think in the current political climate, the failure to appreciate the progress that has been made through both individual initiative and social change, mm. and your family's experience speaks to that. There are huge numbers of families whose experience speaks to that in, in the UK, in the US. So many leaps forward have been made thanks to individuals and community campaigning. And I think when you instruct a new generation that things are still terrible, everyone's still racist, it's still white supremacy, even though people worked really hard to get rid of white supremacy in mm. the US and were successful, it's an incredibly rare movement now, mm. you tell people that things never get better. You, you deprive them of the stories of improvement that exist, right. and then they just in, embrace this kind of fatalistic approach. That's right. And they life. also make a big deal. You know, it's not like I've never experienced racism. I do. But it hasn't prevented me from having a life. You know, once upon a time, racism really prevented you mm. from having a life, right? And, and so you need to keep things in perspective, but they're not because of the victimhood thing. You want to tell loads of stories about the racism or the sexism or whatever it is that you've experienced because of this Olympics of victimhood that we've yes. got, yeah. where the bigger victim you are, the more respected you are. And it's human nature to want to get people's attention and respect. And if that's going to get you respect, then you build up, the you, you make yourself into, into the biggest victim that you can. That is not helpful for personal happiness yeah. and for success for a community. I could carry on talking to you for yes. ages and ages, yes, but yes, I've got just yes. one more question, yes, yes, which is in relation to Brexit, the great unspeakable in the education system. I yeah. don't know if there are any teachers who vote for Brexit. Presumably there are. But I wonder how much you think Brexit could present if it were allowed to happen and if it goes ahead and if the ideas and the spirit and the um, beliefs behind it mm -hmm. among those 17.4 million voters, if that were to go ahead, how much do you think it could assist with some of the problems you've been talking about individuation, division, tension, the lack of any sense of national togetherness. Is Brexit oh, I don't know. I an don't assistance think... to some of that? No, I don't think it'll assist at all because there are few uh, teachers who are Brexiteers. Mm. Most of them are ardent Remainers and believe that it's a terrible thing. And so then it means that they're doubling down on this right. and okay. they're even more determined to continue with the narrative that they've current that they're currently pushing on people which is anti-nation state and so on so I, I i don't think it'll be helpful at all i mean i always think it's really interesting with brexit that people think of uh brexiteers as racist uh, i think quite the opposite actually what i mean by that is that i mean there are all sorts of arguments people just don't understand or think about like the fact that because immigration but basically turned into a, a white only thing that was going on. I mean, that's what the EU did, mm. right? It made immigration white. Mm. So you can come here quite easily if you're Polish, but it's impossible to come here as a Nigerian or as a Jamaican and so on. And, and all those Remainers who are running around saying, oh, I'm not racist, I'm a Remainer. Oh, isn't it interesting how you want immigration to be white, <laughs> yeah. you know? If you think back to the 1980s, you might see 
black waiters in a restaurant, for instance, you never see them anymore. Mm. That's because they're all Eastern European. And that is because, and that's where I would say racism is alive and well nowadays, you know, restaurants uh, would rather have your front facing, not just restaurants, hotels, all of those kinds of places. They want the front facing staff to be white. So the black staff can do the cleaning, mm. can do the, the washing up in the back and so on. But the white staff are the ones that are going to front face the, the customer. And what tons of, of white immigration does is that it gives you the, the opportunity opportunity to have front facing white staff and you don't have to then employ the kids that come out of my school. So the kids who are coming out of the inner city schools who are not going to go on to university because not everybody should go on to university. Some kids are, are you know, are not, are not university types and that's fine. They want to go off and get jobs. But the, the black kids coming out are, are not going to be able to compete because they're having to compete with huge amounts of white immigration in, an, a, in a system which is racist. And the remainers march around saying, well, we want to continue that as much as we can because we want to, we, and, 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 and it makes me furious. So that makes me furious, for instance. The other thing that makes me furious uh, with regard to Brexit is that, you know, as, a, as an employer, for instance, I always think to myself, well, you want to have as many people to choose out of, you know, in terms of to, 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 to employ, right? You know, for the, I got, you know, I don't just hire teachers in a, in a school. You mm. hire caretakers, you hire cleaning staff, you hire office staff, you hire all sorts of people. And if the black kids coming out of the schools aren't turning up on time, aren't bringing a pen to work, <laughs> like you should bring a pen to school, aren't doing their homework and all that kind of thing because the schools have failed them, yet the white kids who are coming out of the Polish schools mm. are doing that because the Polish schools are good <laughs> and teach them well. Well, I'd far prefer as an employer to employ that Polish guy than I want to employ the black kid from the inner city. So I keep on employing the Polish guys. The employers never complain, do they, about the state of our education system? So when some idiot like me in 2010 gets up and <laughs> says it's broken, the employers turn around and say, it's not broken, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. Because it is fine, because they're employing loads of immigrants. They are not employing the kids I'm teaching. Now, if they're forced into a situation where they have to employ the kids who are coming out of our, 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 our education system, Somebody other than me is yeah. going to take notice of the fact that the system is broken. And then big guys who run the big companies who have a voice, because I don't have a voice, but they have a voice. They're going to start saying something's wrong with our education system because they haven't noticed so far because of the huge amounts of, the Im of immigration that is white, well-educated, hardworking, all the things that they want, right? They got that at the moment. If that changes, then it might spur them to shout about the fact that our education system is broken. Catherine, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.